You've mentioned a few times already uh, Mevlana Rumi, Mevlana Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi. Tell us about Rumi. Um, well, uh, Jalaluddin, I mean, you couldn't have a more Muslim name <laughs> than Rumi. Many people know him as Rumi, uh, which is great, but it, I think he especially, he's even written poetry about it, would definitely want people to use his full name, uh, particularly because, like I said, you couldn't find a more Islamic name. Jalal al-Din literally means the glory of religion or the glory of, of life or God. Jalal al-Din Muhammad, uh, which is not only after the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, but the word itself, even the name Muhammad, literally means of praise, one to be praised. Uh, and Rumi, uh, although Rumi wasn't his original name, Balkhi also was a name. And in those days, and even to this very day, uh, people's surnames are often associated to where they come from, geographically. So, uh, people who have the last name Masri, for example, Masr is the name for Egypt in Arabic. So, even if they're in a different geographic location, often when people's last names are Masri, they have some descendants from Egypt. Uh, if uh, Rumi, for example, the reason he was named Rumi was because he was from Rome, but not Rome in uh, uh, Italy, but Rome was and still is the name for Orthodox Christianity. And the region he came from was actually a predominant Christian region, actually, uh, in, in Turkey, where he resided. Uh, it was still part of the, the Christian shall I say kingdom, I guess, uh, of the East, Eastern Christianity. But Balkhi was his original name because that's where he came from, and he fled as a refugee from there to Konya. But, you know, his trek is actually really very well documented to an extent. Uh, the same story kind of is shared by many people, even though many people now today with the rise of nationalism throughout history want to claim Rumi as theirs. <laughs> he's Persian, he's Turkish, no, he's Arab. <laughs> You know, in those days, I think people were not so quick to say, I'm Afghani or I'm a Turkish, you know, I'm Turkish or I'm Arab. I think regions played a large role in the way people saw where they came from, but more so language as well. You know, often I would hear or read that what language you spoke is who you were. So if you spoke Greek, you were Greek. If you spoke Arabic, you were Arab as well that it wasn't really a blood issue uh, to an extent. But uh, Rumi uh, was an ascetic, but he, before he became really a, a, a Sufi and, and founded the, uh, the, Mevlavi, the Mevlavi dervishes, he was also still a, a scholar of jurisprudence. His father was a, a scholar of jurisprudence. And uh, when they did move, he kind of followed in the same footsteps. And it wasn't until he met uh, Shams al-Din Tabrizi, who also gave him insight into the mysticism, the mystical aspect. So for quite some time, he very well may have been of the church of dogma, shall I say, or very dogmatic in his approach or in the jurisprudence of that time. Um, but he found, at least from what I can decipher from his writings and what history tells us, uh, an aspect of mysticism that opened a new portal through Islam, something that he knew very well, uh, but towards universality of belief. It's, it's amazing to me the first time I heard or read poetry by, by Rumi speaking of, of becoming intoxicated with love for the beloved. And I began to really realize why people who might take things literally would shy away from such a lack of a better term, liberal approach towards religion, or a less dogmatic approach towards religion. But as a musician and, you know, somebody who appreciates writing and, and whatnot, uh, I understood right away what he meant. This intoxication is really just a, a, a practice of passion. You know, something that I've, he can, in words, has in words, put the way I feel when I play an instrument, which is very difficult to explain to people who follow a more traditional or dogmatic view. And so part of me is why, that's why I've kind of um, gravitated towards Sufism, but I've seen others do the same. 
Um, Mevlana, the word Mevlana in Arabic, Mevlana in Turkish, is just our Lord. Um, which is another aspect of Sufism that he really... Sufism existed before Rumi, but he really kind of put it on the map through his writings and through the time period he probably lived in, that medieval time period, and the geographic location he was at. So, I mean, all of those factors with the Ottomans, uh, not quite there yet, but almost there, uh, coming into being and, and all of the geographical uh, and political things occurring in the region, I think just with the spread of Islam, this was another aspect that kind of gave a new revival to it. Uh, and his writing, I mean, what can be said about somebody who's a, a dead 13th century poet that could still be on the bestsellers list in America for the past 10 years because so many people have translated his works. Um, I had the privilege of actually performing with Coleman Barks uh, many years ago at the um, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where we were celebrating Rumi's birthday. And um, we sat and, and spoke and I asked him, I said, you know what? resonated with you and, and how did you, you know, get along with the language? Uh, and he, he was actually uh, very moved by Rumi and he had uh, Persian friends who helped him translate some of the works and he gained some of the essence in it, in, in it as well. But I, I don't think that you can or need a literal translation necessarily to understand where this is going. Because I'll, I'll read Coleman Barks or Kabir Hamensky uh, translations, which are predominantly in English, but then I'll you know, find something in Arabic or try to translate myself something from Farsi or, uh, uh, or Turkish and, and realize that the essence is still there. And that, in the end, for me, I think, is what embodies Sufism in general, is that it is all about essence. It's not about dogma. It's really about essence.